everyone welcome bismillahir rahmanir rahim surah yunus verse 38 uh, this verse has uh, something very important uh, mentioned and i thought that we should go through some aspects of what is covered in this verse and you will find that there are some interesting aspects reflections which we need to consider these are the references and this is our contact in case there is any query or question recap so far through the quran we acquire knowledge of the system of the inner's finer details which aid in understanding rububiyat and the universe why he was sent to mankind through the medium of the messengers of allah all of whom were human beings the universe was created in six stages and the earth was made suitable for the sustenance of man who possesses choice and intent the law of requital was put in place so that each and every deed of man manifests its outcome time was created through the alternation of day and night to make man aware of his finite physical existence in this world Mankind is one brotherhood and the aim of the Quran is to bring all of humanity together after removing their differences while treading on the path of deen results take time to manifest their outcomes hence there is a need to remain steadfast and display patience iman and saleh deeds have a higher scale in terms of contributing to the development of the human self because iman and saleh deeds take into account the life of the hereafter and our self develops accordingly humans humans need quranic guidance as only allah can provide this guidance the quran is al haq humans always follow zan without the guidance of allah's book and we remember we had discussed this uh, uh, term zan which means some kind of a conjecture doubt suspicion uh, which is opposite of haq basic human issue life has reached the human form by passing through evolutionary va- valleys whatever man has received in this automatically from nature are those same basic instincts which have also been bestowed on other animals so animals have certain instincts and we also have certain instincts when a human child arrives in the world like every newborn animal it knows instinctively where its source of nourishment lies and how to obtain benefit from it there is only one issue facing animals and that is the fulfillment of physical needs because animals do not have cognitive abilities and for this the guidance of the instincts is sufficient that is why they have no need for any research or any need for inquiry and we witness it all around us in the animal kingdom if man's issue had been confined to just this then he also would not have needed to make any endeavors but his issue is not confined to this in front of him there are scores of other important challenges of life like communal and social and societal problems political and economic national and international issues and extending beyond the physical world there are the numerous conflicts of his inner life the dissonances between his consciousness and subconsciousness his multiple psychological conundrums the development of his self and the question of the future So human beings are quite complicated when we look at their cognitive abilities. Discovering the solution for these problems is not within the realm of instinctual guidance, and this is taken from the meanings of the Quran, Volume One, Page Three Hundred Thirty Three. Now let us look at the verse which is the, we are going to discuss in detail today, Ten Thirty Eight. The human intellect cannot produce anything like the Quran. We need to figure out why it is so. ام یقولونا افتراه کل فاتو بسورت مثله ود او من استطاعتم من دون الله ان کنتم صادقین just ponder on this that these people say about this kind of code of life that it is not from allah it is self compiled by this rasul say to them that if you are truthful in your claim that man, that man can put together this kind of code of life then this is an easy technique to prove this claim true that you make not the whole quran but only one surah like it and leaving allah aside and this is important and leaving allah aside for this purpose you can call upon whomever you wish to invite for your help if you are true in this claim of yours then accept this challenge 
Now, this verse, uh, apparently, if we go through it, it doesn't make much impact. But if we look at it from both the aspects of Mu'mineen as well as those who do not wish to follow the guidance of the Quran, then a lot is implicit in this particular verse. And these are the aspects which we will analyze next. And there are three more verses. We can have a look on those as well. A similar uh, similar aspect is mentioned over there too. Now let us look at the word su surah. Now this is the root. It means to overpower someone, assault, climbing a wall, defense wall around a city. Height is derived from this eminence, superiority, loftiness, and elevated status. So there are mixed meanings for of this particular word, surah. Now there are derivatives of this uh, word which are given in, in the Lugat al-Quran, higher status and glamour associated with the sultan, some kind of a leader, bracelet as a sign of higher status and of higher rank. A sawir is plural of surah, and it is this word is used in the Quran. Commander in an army riding a horse called knight. Rank and status, height, respect and elevated status. Furthermore, that building which is beautiful and rises high like a skyscraper. So surah means something which is rising high. So it will help us to raise the eminence of our own self as well. Many reasons are noted for calling the Quranic surah as surah. Some think that these are called surah because of their loftiness. Some think that since the previous surah serves as a step ladder for the next ones, hence it is called surah. And that is the way we should look at the Quran as well. As we proceed from the front to the end, we can see that there is a tremendous coordination and harmony from one surah to another. Some say that since these appear in level after level, hence the sum total completes the structure of the Quran just like a building. Some say that since the commands of the Quran are preserved within these, hence like a protective wall, it is called surah. In my own understanding as a, as a student of the Quran, I feel that all of these are applicable to the Quran. A sign is also called surah. It has appeared in the Quran in some of the above forms other than as a chapter. Please see Lugatul Quran by G.A. Purvez under the above root. Now let us look at some further reflections. It is a simple straightforward verse but includes within it the fundamental significance of the Quran as the book of guidance from Allah. All of us who are students of the Quran need to come to grips with this important aspect by employing the full cognitive power of our intellect and emotions. If there is any crack or crevice in this conviction, then we will fail to have that pristine and eminent self which Allah requires us to have for the pursuit of the aim of deen. Now, this is the Iman aspect of it, which we I have put down over here that for in order to have Iman in the Quran, we have to concentrate on the message which is being given for ourselves. The Quran declares that only its guidance can help us to acquire this kind of self, hence the developed self itself becomes evidence of the Quran being al-Haq and leads to this conclusion that no human being can produce anything like this book. So the issue before us is not that Quran has declared itself Haq, Al Haq, and we blindly accept it. Quran nowhere accepts blind uh, following. It is because it is for the development of our self in through our intellect. And if our intellect is not developed by using the Quran, then it is of no consequence for ourself. So we will be in a state of jahim and will remain in status quo, and we will not move forward. In order to understand this challenge of the Quran, we need to first look at human intellect and its approach in living this physical life. The world around us with all these issues is present before our eyes and this represents the model based on pure human intellect over a period of the past many centuries, leaving out the brief earlier Islamic era based on pure Quran about which we still keep daydreaming. Another caution for the students of the Quran which is implicit in this verse is that people may come with their own contaminated versions of the Quran and to never fall prey to them and do not abandon the pure Quran. Otherwise, no benefits will be accrued in this life and hence there will be no life of the hereafter. No developed self, hence no deen, 
more on this later. The issue over here is that whatever we are finding around us in the name of the Quran through translations, through these various, various expositions, and uh, now we see a lot of material on the YouTube as well, we should remain very, very attentive to this fact which the Quran has put forward after our use of intellect that nothing like the Quran can be produced by human mind because human mind does not have that ability to think like the infinite. But we can understand it by using our rational self. Now let us look at a few more points. The Quran has presented itself as the only guidance which can provide a world free from fear and all kinds of cognitive dissonances. So point over here is that if we do not recognize our own dissonances, then obviously we will not be able to understand the Quran. For this, the Quran puts forward a challenge to all those who reject its guidance, whether outwardly or inwardly, that whatever your reasons may be for rejecting it, just reflect on its laws, values, principles, attributes, and instructions. I try to cover all aspects of it. That is laws, values, principles. When we say attributes, these are the divine attributes which we have to acquire and then manifest. And instructions. And compare these with the man-devised value system and reach this question. Can the human intellect ever produce anything like that which is given in the Quran? And we will look at some of the verses and we will come to this conclusion that human mind is not capable of, of coming to that kind of a solution which is given in the Quran. Then decide whether you wish to carry on living in your system or prefer to live under the system of deen. Then compare the best selves produced by the man devised systems with those selves which Allah's way he helps to create. Now this is a crux and 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 this this was something which I came to grips with after a lot of thinking over many years. Then compare the best selves produced by the man device systems with those selves which Allah's way helps to create. And we we can read these books like Eric Fromm, Carl Jung, even Jordan Peterson in recent time, and the past thinkers, and see that what kind of a self they had and what kind of a self we have acquired by following the way of a land by understanding it. Examples of some salient models from the past are detailed within its pages. We have already covered two models in detail, those of Hazrat Yusuf and Ibrahim. The model of Rasulullah is detailed in the Quran and the whole Quran serves as an evidence for that. Just see the word used over here, Khulq and Azim, that Rasulullah acquired that self which met the claim of the Quran for the creation of, of man, for the creation of Adam. So he reached that supreme level of Khulq which met the demands and requirements of being created as a human being. And this is something which needs a lot of our reflection and we should keep it in mind. Then it invites to go through all that is written in this regard and bring all those intellectuals together and then produce any part like that of the Quran related to the human psyche and its issues in relation to the world and the life of the hereafter. You will not be able to produce anything like it. And this is the challenge of the Quran that you cannot, because you don't you cannot think at your own like, like the Quran. And that is why it serves as an external guidance. Because whatever you will think as the best in the context of the whole of mankind, it will already be there noted in the book. Now attempts to write invent a new Quran. And over here, this part was added later on because I spoke to Brother Asif regarding this and uh, got these uh, points that it is not that human beings did not attempt to write something like the Quran. They have, and we can see the evidence of it and the quality of that work which human beings have produced associating it that it is like the Quran. When the Quran arrived in the 7th century and the Muslims managed to establish the system of deen under the supreme leadership of Rasulullah, the promise of Allah got fulfilled as is noted in the Quran, the verse 2455. They had Iman on, for example, 
it is the verse from the Quran, Inna Allaha la yugayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayyiru ma bi anfusihim, where Quran states that the state of any nation cannot change until they change what is within their own psyche. And uh, we have gone through this verse in detail under Surah Rad. And the second uh, law is, Amma ma yanfam nasa fayam kusu fil earth, that what remains on earth is that which is good for the mankind, which means if we follow the Quran, then we will be able to bring all those aspects out of the humanity, which is good for them. This was a shock for non-Muslims of that time. As it happened, the opposing forces set out on the task of undermining this system. Now, this is an important point to which we have to come to, to grip because Quran helped to create that system back in 7th century and which lasted for a while because of that promise which it made to Muslims, Muslims of all times, that if you have Iman and Salih deeds and you come together, then a system will emerge ultimately through the hands of this Jamaat al-Mu'mineen, as long as they stick to the pure Quran. And for non-Muslims are those lands which were conquered and where Muslims went for the good of mankind, People over there, those who were at the helm of affairs, who were in power and had rejected the Quran, they tried to look into this recipe, this formula, which gave success to Muslims. And this is the point I'm trying to make over here. They quickly figured out, based on intellect and reasoning, that the ideology behind this success is solely the Quran and is based on the help of Allah promised by him to jamaat e mumineen and that was the point they picked up as well. And this is the point which people, non-Muslims, even now in this world have picked it up. They know that is why their efforts made not to let people go towards the Quran, pure Quran. They came to this conclusion that in order to stop the expansion of this human reforming system, it needs to be undermined at a core level, i.e. to somehow contaminate the Quranic teaching itself. They could not produce a new Quran, but contamination was far easier. Even a minor shirk can make this formula null and void, and they got it. They couldn't produce a new Quran because they cannot, firstly. Secondly, if they had called it, the original Quran is always preserved and protected so people can compare with that. But what they could do was that they contaminated it. And in order to contaminate that, they produce those things and then they said these are from Rasulullah. Whereas the Quran has clearly said, and the proof and the evidence is within the Quran, that anyone following the Quran as a pure uh, manuscript, as a pure uh, manuscript or code for guidance, he cannot simply go outside the Quran because he doesn't need it. And that is the point. And we can check it ourselves as well that since we have come to the pure Quran, we have seen that we don't have to go outside the Quran under any circumstances because there is no need for that. We, our own self tells us that I don't need it. They succeeded in a matter of few centuries and this ingress of the so-called Hadith literature seeped in gradually which suited Malukiyat and religious clergy. Because when we leave the Quran, then Malukiyat is going to come in in all forms, whether it is a modern democracy, whether it is royalty or dictatorship, whatever name we can give it, because then man starts ruling other human beings. Then man devised system emerges. And that is the point we have to keep it in mind. And religious clergy is, of course, rules through the intellectual side of human beings. This class of mullah emerged and the Quranic Islam turned into madhab or religion. The Quran was abandoned as the constitution of the state and a new Quran in the form of Ahadith, which is declared to be mithluhu mahu, arrived under which every human desire can be fulfilled legitimately. And this led to the decline of Muslims, which is still in place in today's world. And that is exactly the state of the modern Christianity, our Christianity is. Because Bible also, through Bible, we can fulfill any desire and it can be justified. 
Abandoning the pure Quran led to the formation of sex, which is the natural cause of being divided. They can never stay united without the pure Quran. The reason is that we have to remove the cognitive dissonances. And if we have dissonances within our head, how are we going to be united? Because then we will never have a common aim. Continuing attempts to write and invent a new Quran, even if there was an organized conspiracy to contaminate the pure Quranic teaching, it was still available in its original book from form preserved and protected by Allah. Some should have realized at some stage that what is promised in the Quran is not being achieved, so let us look at the causes. And that was a very obvious question for anyone who's got two brain cells that why are we backward? Why are we suffering? Let's go back to the original Quran whose model was once established and successfully followed. However, even if some people did rise to counter this decline, being in a mon minority, it did not materialize. And in any case, Mullah, what he did was that he was supported by Malukiyat, and we can see that even united today, ensured the silencing of dissenting voices, came up with the issue of Murtad, and this shut the doors to any intellectual questioning of the prevalent religion for fear of reprisals. And this situation is still continuing to this day, though it is now dampening down a bit. The book written by Alama Parvez, which has been translated into English on this issue of apostasy and slavery, is an outstanding book. And we should go through that because it has been analyzed in detail and what effect this Murtad thing has on the intellectual development of Muslims of today. Because it is continuing for centuries now that whoever tried to use his intellect and uh, countered the argument of uh, Mullah has been uh, either uh, killed or he, is, he had to run away and leave those places or escape or was imprisoned. The translation of the Quran were done out of reverence and for earning swab. Swab is some kind of an abstract reward which one will get by reciting these words in the life of the hereafter completely against the law of requital, which carried the bias of the translator. And by reading these translations, not much can change cognitively. The way that the Quran is translated, there are contradictions everywhere. For example, on the one hand, it says every person is accountable. Then it says that Allah forgives whomever he wishes. The term Salat turned into Namaz, Zakat turned into two and a half percent charity, obedience turned into worship. These words like Abd, are being translated as worship. Welcome to the new Quran. So these are the things which we have to keep it in mind. That And that is what surprised me as well, that when I read this verse, for example, 4522, which is coming later, that Allah has created heavens and the earth bil haq so that everyone is held accountable. And I said, all of these guys, they read these verses, even in translation. Why it doesn't have any impact on them? Because the whole thing is neutralized when they say Allah forgives whomever he wishes. And this false concept of Allah is deeply ingrained into their heads over generations. Tafasir, which are the expositions, are not much different and include interpretations based on ahadiths, which lead to this conclusion that the Quran presents no system and Islam is just about praising Allah and carrying out some kinds of rituals and that is it. The deplorable state of Muslims is before us in the world and this is being made even more, uh, you know, in a concentrated form because of lack of education and exposure to the higher education in today's world. And this is all due to the efforts to abandon the pure Quran and follow this man-devised religion of Islam. Since it is Muslims who are meant to carry out all those duties, the which Allah has outlined for himself, hence we are unable to establish the system of deen and whole of humanity is continuing to suffer at the hands of Iblisi systems. Let us be very clear, wherever there are problems in this world, wherever there is a poverty, slavery, exploitation, and, and every evil which the Quran has declared very clearly is because of these Muslims who are not following the Quran. 
we need not be disheartened as we have the pure Quran with us and uh, Allama Parvez has made it easier for us to study the system of deen and to ignore all that is said in the name of religion and stand firm-footed on the path of the Quran. The system of deen is within our reach. And because Quran is protected and preserved by Allah himself, so we can always go back to the original text and look at it in the light of the Lugat al-Quran. And Allama Pervez has made our life extremely easy by deciphering the Quran as a system of deen, by bringing out the system of deen. And if we see in a religious world, nobody talks of deen as a system. Two verses sum it up, decision is left in our hands. First is, فَلْيَاتُ بِحَدِيثِمْ مِثْلِهِ إِنْ كَانُوا صَادِقِينَ Say to them that if you're truthful in your statement that this Quran is my own creation and I'm relating it to Allah, or this is mere poetry and invention, then its decision is very easy. You too make some law like this and bring it over. The matter will become crystal clear. You have poets among you and also magicians. Gather them all together with you and demonstrate by compiling a code of life like the Quran. And this is for us as well as Mumineen, as students of the Quran, that we have to convince our intellect by trying to look at every verse of the Quran, our couple of verses with the whole context in mind, that can human being think like that? Could I think like that before I came to the Quran? And the answer will be evidently clear. Next verse is Tilka Ayatullahi Natluha Alaika Bil Hakke Fabi Ayye Hadisim Badallahi wa Ayatihi Yuminun. That Allah whose laws are functioning in the outer universe with such beauty and balance, He is the one who has given laws in this book for the shaping of human society, which are sent down on you with Hak. Ask them if they do not accept Iman despite reflecting and reasoning in these laws and His signs, which are dispersed throughout the universe then what will be that special narrative? So Hadith is a narrative on which they will accept Iman. So the Quran has, there are a number of other verses on similar lines where Quran has challenged us, asked us to think, reflect. Why this issue needs to be addressed, some further reflections. Uh, please keep it in mind that there might be some repetitions here and there, but those are really to reiterate and, and strengthen the basic issue in our mind. In the world, thousands of books are printed and published each year on possibly every subject of interest. And some of these books are written by, by highly intellectual human beings, but none claims to be the complete book of guidance for mankind. Why? Then the Quran itself states that when this guidance is presented before these people, they say, what they say is that we have heard it, but it is not something we cannot produce, but these are just the stories of the past people. Of course, these are stories of the past people to warn us, to tell us that if you follow the wrong path, you will also end up in hell. When verses are presented before them, they say, we heard, and we too can produce like this. All it contains is tales of the ancients. And I have heard Muslims saying like that. It is not something which is left to the non-Muslims that they will say that. Even Muslims who read the Quran and who earn swab in their own mind by just reciting its words. Muslims and non-Muslims all go through the Quran and read these verses, but none can produce something like the Quran not in terms of its style or prose, but in terms of the laws, attributes, and values it contains in relation to the system of deen. It's not trying to rhyme it that uh, Quran is some kind of a poetry. The issue is that what is in every verse for our thought process? And that is the issue we have to keep in mind. People who have compiled a hadith and later declared these to be wahi a khafi. Khafi means something secret. They are saying that Quran is a wahi a jali, that it is an open, clear, and evident uh, revelation, whereas khafi is which was secretly brought on Rasulullah. To be wahi khafi of Allah, i.e., like the Quran, just cast a glance on the state of their contents. If we read these books in the light of the modern day developed human intellect, we will be gross, grossly disappointed. These do not even, some of these do not even meet the normal rational side of human beings. 
In fact, through the Quranic light, we assess and evaluate the standard of the intellectual acumen of all books written by human minds. Just compare these with the books written by Lama Parvez expounding Deen Islam based on the Quran. In fact, Quran can be used as light, and we have gone through these aspects in our previous uh, talks, that using the Quran, we can in fact assess the intellectual value of any book, any book whether it is of fiction or of non-fiction or highly intellectual books of, uh, are written by top uh, scholars of the world. And I've done this. Despite this challenge of the Quran, no human being has been able to accept its cha challenge. Why? Some facts. We do not have any inner guidance and each one of us progressively learns according to the means available to us. We can only gain limited knowledge via our senses and perception through the use of our intellect and our efforts based on our resources in some field of interest related to our finite physical life. Physical death is a fact of life. We die at some stage of our life. This puts a deadline on our existence in this world. We need external guidance in a complete form to get the maximum out of our life, which can provide answers to all questions in relation to our creation, which is body and self its purpose and destination, man device systems and their limitations, any alternative system, time scales, accountability, and above all, the possibility of the life of the hereafter. If our life has a purpose, if our creation has a purpose, and death is waiting for our physical life as far as this world is concerned, then there has to be a guidance for us to make use of the finite time we have so that we can get maximum out of it. And this is something which only the Quran can provide. No other book. Life of the hereafter, it factually exists because Quran brings before us the facts of our existence. It brings before us the aim of our existence, aim of our creation, and then what lies beyond our death, that is, there is another life, there is a system of deen existing over there, and then Allah's concept. The Quran provides an outline of this life and links it with our life at the level of the self in this world, and that is where we learn the intrinsic value of possessing a self, and that is where we learn the, to respect and dignify other selves. Any human thought which does not take into account the life of the hereafter the Quran is a very raw thought and cannot even comprehend the salient parts of the Quranic message. The human mind has dissonances at a fundamental level and these lead to the creation of Zan. And we can check it. It is not something we cannot check. We develop doubts about everything in our life and when we check it in the light of the Quran, those become facts before us, then we can differentiate between, between Batil and Haq. Of course, this takes time to acquire this ability, this potential. This kind of cognitive makeup needs to eliminate the effects of these internal aberrations to think clearly. The state of the human self is such that what we write last year, we start to revise it next year because it is evolutionary, it is progressive and it will keep on progressing. The breadth of our understanding increases with experience and, and reading. And why I put down this sentence is that unless we think on those lines, we will not be motivated enough. We will not have enough incentive to come to the Quran and then keep exploring it with this in mind that this journey will never end. And Dr. Wasim helped me to write this sentence. The concept of Allah as an ultimate reality, not being aware of this concept or not willing to accept it will lead to not developing ourself. Its absence cannot give us that developed self which is solely linked to this model. Hence, cannot understand the significance of the divine attributes and their need of the human self to manifest these. There's a lot in these lines, so in our own time, we can go through them again. Why Arabs could not accept the challenge of the Quran? If Arabs had accepted this challenge and had managed to compile some book to counter the Quran, all confrontation and fighting would have ended. Despite this challenge of the Quran and their being linguists, they could not accept it and failed to produce anything like it. Instead, what they witnessed was that those who accepted its guidance not only changed themselves into eminent human beings, but they also stood up for the cause of Allah against their relations, friends, neighbors, siblings, parents, wives, husbands, children. 
they witnessed that those who accepted its guidance, they got a new life. They were totally changed human beings. They were not willing to budge an inch from the conviction and iman they got. Husbands left their wives, wives left their husbands, children left their parents. And we witnessed this, even it is noted in the Quran, because there are verses related to that. They were so selfless that they preferred others' needs over themselves. And see what kind of a change brought into this human being. These potentials came out very clearly, which Quran refers to and says, these are kept within you. And they became different human beings from what they were. They continued to oppose this message for two decades and went to war with Mominin, with the Mominin, even when they had migrated from Mecca. However, they still failed to meet this challenge of the Quran because they couldn't. For meeting the challenge of this Quran, they had to first understand the Quran. And once they understood the Quran, they would have learned that they don't need another Quran. This Quran is meeting all their needs for all times. The Quran has summed up the reason for this. They were convinced of its being al-Haq, but their pride and arrogance prevented them from accepting it. Wajahadu biha was that ha anfosuhum zulman wa aluvan. And they rejected those signs in iniquity and arrogance, though their selves were convinced thereof. And Quran says that they had accepted, they had deep down accepted that what is being said by the Quran is a fact, is haq. But this, once they rejected it, they thought, why should we accept it? There is some kind of an egoism within us which prevents us at times and turns us into arrogant beings. And we witness it even in today's world. A lot of people who read the Quran and once you present the verses to them, they still don't accept it. And they prefer to go along with their own desires and wishes. Acceptance of this challenge may lead to guidance. This challenge of the Quran has been to mankind for all times. No one has accepted this challenge so far. Why? A finite mind cannot think like an infinite, fully developed intellect. It can understand it using its rational side, but that too after freeing it from all personal biases and proclivities. When we become a moment precisely as is defined by the Quran, only then does the Quran reveal the intrinsic value of ourself, and then this self enables us to understand its guidance and the need for the system of deen. And that is the criterion that is the crux of the message of the Quran that when we go through it and we develop ourselves, acquire Iman, do Salih deeds, then we feel the need for the system of deen, which is referred to throughout the Quran, beginning to the end. Because wherever there is a collective tense used for Mu'minin, that means it is referring to the system of deen. When Quran says, that you should come together, hold on to Allah's book, and don't have differences, which means you have to establish a system. Before having this self, it just reads it without coming to grips with its relevance, never mind producing any part of it. Even to know this fact, we need to delve into the finer aspects of the Book of Allah. And this is where the heart and mind come together to recognize that only Allah can be the writer of this book. Another related point is that the Quran transformed those who accepted Iman and followed it. For example, in relation to the messenger, it says, Ma kunta tadri mal kitabu wala walal imanu. You did not know what is the book and what is Iman. And then it states, Wa inna ka la tahdi in ila sratim mustaqim. And verily, you do guide to sratim mustaqim. So Rasulullah himself accepted Iman first. And Quran has referred to that in Surah Al Baqarah. And then once he was convinced, of course, he was convinced that the message was coming on him and he had accepted it because he was looking for it. Quran has said that you were looking for guidance and we gave you guidance. So these are the things which we have to keep it in mind. These are very finer aspects. The issue of completeness of the Quran. I've drawn a simple schematic here just to illustrate the point. The Quran is a complete indivisible whole from beginning to end as the book of guidance. It needs to be taught and learned as an academic book. Introducing anything which is not compatible with its formula will make its effects null and void. And that is what shirk is. Since it deals with human cognitive transformation, hence we need to be fully aware of what ought to be in relation to what it is. 
And over here, what I've done is I've, the whole is now divided into three parts. To be aware of each part in the context of the whole is required in order to develop ourselves for the system of Deen. Obviously, we cannot understand the whole unless we approach it by looking at the constituents and then seeing the constituents in the context of the whole. So then it becomes part of ourselves that we are fully convinced of the whole and then we look at the constituents as the need arises. Deen is a complete system based on the whole of the Quran. And if we try to put a wedge into it, we try to introduce something, can we introduce any product based on human intellect and emotions and get the same whole? If we introduce anything into it, then this whole is destroyed. Then we cannot get any benefit from it. And this is the point which Quran makes repeatedly and tells us, don't do shirk. The question of absolute good and absolute evil. I thought this is important in relation to what is in the Quran and how, in a, in a what a simplified version, the Quran makes it clear to man that what is absolute good and what is absolute evil. And this is taken from uh, Alama Perez, uh, Volume 1, Mutalb al Furqan. The issue of what is is very straightforward. But the question of what ought to be is such that the human intellect has remained extremely inquisitive and anxious about this from the earliest era of its consciousness till the present day. In the terminology of philosophy, this issue is called the conundrum of good and evil for which the terms khair and shar have appeared in the Arabic language. And the Quran, every individual in the world wishes to do such deeds which are profitable to him and refrain from those affairs which are of loss to him. But here again, that same question arises. What is exactly, what is it exactly that is called benefit and what is loss? In other words, having turned full circle, human thought again halts at this initial point that what is the satisfactory solution to what ought to be. Because science also tells us what it is, but it can't tell us what it ought to be, what it should be. And same is our problem, that we know wherever we are that what it is, but then we have to figure out where are we going, what we should be. How do we meet the needs of the hereafter, if there is a hereafter? How do we spend this life? which is the best to get maximum out of our life at a self's level. Human beings have established their own individual standards of profit and loss. For example, if a shopkeeper sells something for more than the cost price, let's say by $2, it will be said that he has profited in this transaction. This kind of profit and loss is called relative. But it depends how did he earn those dollars. And that is where the question of good and evil comes in. But human thought is continuing to be lost in such a maze of profit and loss where these are not relative but are absolute, i.e. absolute good and absolute evil. That which is khair profitable in every condition or is shar in every condition. Continuing that, the Quran declares that it is simply not possible for human intellect that it can ascertain absolute good and absolute evil. Only the way of Allah can do this. The Quran states, but it is possible that you dislike a thing which is good for you and that you love a thing which is bad for you. But Allah knows and you know not. And when Quran says Allah knows, that means the Quran will tell you. At times he dislikes such things which are in fact hair, i.e. beneficial, and prefers those things and holds them dear which are harmful to him. And after this it is stated that you cannot yourself determine what thing is in reality beneficial for you and what thing is harmful. Only Allah knows this. In another verse it is stated, the supplication that man should make for good he makes for evil for man is given to haste. And supplication over here is what we pursue in life, what we try to obey. Why can man not discover the standard for khair and shar himself? The reason for this is that he is simply not, not capable of dissociating his decisions from the emotions of his self-interest, whether these are individual or collective. Therefore, the standard devised or defined by him will be relative. It cannot be absolute. By sidestepping the philosophical argument of khair and shar, we will state in brief and commonly understood terms that Allah has established the permanent values and immutable principles and has passed these on to mankind through wahi. Every one of those actions which is according to these principles and values will be khair or beneficial, that which is contrary to them will be shar or harmful. 
The question is not about the material benefit or loss in declaring that one is shar or the other is khair. The question is of the benefit or loss which the self of these individual individuals accrues. And that is the point which only Quran can tell us that you have a self and anything which is good for that self in the light of the Quran is good and will stay good and which is bad, which harms yourself is evil. And that is where the solution of this problem lies. From this, the decision about virtue and evil, good and bad, reward and punishment takes place. Those deeds are virtuous, good and righteous through which his self is developed and strengthened. Evil, bad and punishable deeds are those because of which the development of his self stunts and becomes weakened. It is another matter that with the strengthening of the self, material benefits also become acquired, which is a characteristic of Islamic system. And this is taken from the meanings of the Quran, volume one. The point over here is that we should make it, this definition of absolute good and evil, we should make it as part of our thought process, as part of our memory and start judging it, not only our own self, but others around us and also look at what is going on in the world in the light of this particular statement. Another point, the Quran cannot be translated. The Quran states, at the beginning, Zalik al Kitabul Araiba Fihe Hudalil Muttakin, i.e., this is the book which, by being free from all kinds of doubts, helps to remove those by becoming Muttaki. And we know the definition of Muttaki as stated in the Quran. For example, see the verse 177 of Surah Al Baqarah. Here, the point to note is that it is not something mechanical, but is inviting us to change our psyche. This means that we have a different psyche without the guidance of Allah. The Quran deals with the whole reality of being human and as such is comprehensive. If we are only using a part of it in order to try and understand it, then we need to look at the whole of the context. Even in the translation of some literary work, it is not possible to transfer from the original text the feelings and sentiments expressed by the author which he has tried to convey through his written words. The translator's own bias may become introduced. This is why some classics are translated by more than one translator. However, there the one who is translating the being of a finite human can still feel and imagine the thoughts of the author. And that is an important point for us that if I'm translating the book of another human being, I can relate to that because it's easier for me as a human being. But once we go through the Quran, we have to look at it that what Allah is asking us to think, what is he asking ourselves to be? And that is the important point. And that is what translations cannot do. It has to be the meanings of the Quran. And then we have to use our focus and our own intensity and our own iman to understand it. Allah is the author of the Quran and if we bear in mind the aspect of his being infinite with a fully developed intellect as relating to human perspective, then when we look at each verse as part of the whole reality, the whole perspective transforms. And we see those aspects related to the human psyche, which we are ordinarily bound to miss. Because if we pick and choose, then we are not understanding it. We have to look at it in the overall context of the system of deen and what is good for mankind remains on earth and how it is going to change the outer world. These will not even enter our mind. This will be more of a phenomenon of discovering our own psyche as we go through its verses. How can we know something about that regarding which we do not even have a prior inkling? The Quran cannot be translated. For example, the first verse of the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah with all his attributes has sent down this supreme book for his creation called Adam. And we know the general translation of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which leaves hardly any impact on ourself. Here at the beginning, two scales are defined through these two attributes are mentioned, Rahman in relation to emergent evolution and Rahim in relation to progressive evolution. So in fact, Quran right at the beginning is telling us that there are two types of scales which are going to be discussed in this book and you should remain cognizant of that. In terms of their Arabic meaning, both are on different weights. These are called Bab. The Quran itself is on the weight of Ar-Rahman. 
which makes it unique in terms of its emergent time scale in the human world. So what Quran is saying is that if you follow the Quran, that is why Quran says, Ar-Rahmanu Allam al-Quran, that Rahman, which is also an emergent scale, and he has given you Quran, which is also an emergent scale, so it will give you those results within the finite time of your existence on this earth. There's a more to it, and we will come to that in some other presentation. What is stated in this verse sets the scene for the comprehension of the whole reality of human creation, its purpose, its need for guidance in relation to this world, and the fact of the continuity of the human self's life beyond physical death. However, this does not mean we can never make use of a translation. If we have already acquired a higher understanding, as we are doing now through these presentations, then we will. if we go to the translation, it will make sense because we will immediately pick up what are the essentials noted in that. Irrespective of those who translate the Quran and wittingly or unwittingly introduce their own bias, for example, by copying previous work, those who have acquired Iman and have studied the books by Alama Parvez in the context of Deen can reach the core of the message by looking at the translations. We can also easily discern the issues with these translations as well. This aspect is important when we are communicating to others and helping them understand the verses in the overall context of the system of Deen. I took help from a lecture which is in Urdu by our Nazim Adaratul Islam, Salim Akhtar Khan. Let us examine some verses and see if human mind can think like that. Now, I've quoted here some verses which I thought uh, will, will help us to understand that Quran is not the product of the human intellect. Allah zi yuti malahu yatazakka, i.e. who gives all his wealth according to need for the nourishment of mankind and in this way the development of his own self takes place. Because Quran says, that you malahu yatazakka that you give it to others despite having some kind of kind of an affection towards wealth. Ma agna anhu malahu wama kasab, and his wealth and possessions on the basis of which he used to resort to sphere opposition did not avail him. See how mal and kasab his deeds are linked together. Very famous verse on the law of requital. Do they not know that Allah created the universe and the earth as bilhaq, not for nothing and for destructive outcome? The aim of this is that the outcome of the deeds of every person is brought out precisely and no one is treated unjustly. The whole of this system of the universe is busy, busy functioning for this purpose, that every deed of man produces its correct result. What a prescient in this verse. Few verses on administering justice. Now over here, there are some very interesting verses, uh, which I've quoted, which uh, throw light on various aspects of justice through the system of deen. And what Allah is asking us as Mu'mineen to understand the intricacies of it. I'll just go through the meanings. For the establishment of this system in which prosperities of both the present and the future are required, the fundamental condition is this, that you remain protector and guardian of justice and fairness in the world. For justice, one fundamental constituent is truthful evidence. You neither give evidence from the side of the plaintiff nor from the side of the defendant. So modern justice system is thrown out of the window. You stand up as a witness from the side of Allah and by always keeping in view justice and fairness, give truthful evidence even if this evidence goes against you or your parents or your relatives. Because in the modern system, if the lawyer of a defendant, even if he's a criminal, is smart enough, he can still win reprieve for his defendant. In this regard, do not differentiate between rich and poor, even do justice to the enemy. You do not become their supporter by abandoning haq and truth. Allah is more concerned about their welfare. Keep this in mind that your emotions do not get in the way of justice. I'll read it again. Keep this in mind that your emotions do not get in the way of justice, nor say anything convoluted, nor excuse yourself from giving evidence. So under the Quran, if I have evidence for something and if I hold it back, then I am a criminal. Remember, the law of mukafat of Allah is well conversant with your deeds, even of your sentiments and proclivities. Just see the prescient and just see how 
much this is free from any human bias and emotions. Some more, and again, I'll, I'll go to the meanings directly. For the establishment of this system, it is necessary that you remain protectors and guardians of justice and fairness in the world, protectors and guardians to such an extent that even enmity towards a nation does not make you inclined towards not doing justice to them. And just see how precise Quran is, that it is not differentiating at the level of human beings as far as justice is concerned in the world. Even enemy, those who are opposing you, who are fighting battles against you, you cannot treat them unjustly. And then see what is happening in the world, which is based on man-made laws and how prisoners of war are treated. And we can see those examples in today's world, like Guantanamo Bay and what happened in Abu Ghraib prisons, and even what is going on in Pakistan. Always administer justice. Always administer justice. This path will take you closest to that standard of life to which Allah wishes to bring you. Therefore, always remain firmly on this path. Remember, the law of requital of Allah is aware of all your deeds. Inna Allaha khabirum bima ta'maloon. And that is how mu'mineen should also develop their self that they are aware of everything what is going on under their jurisdiction. And just think that can, other than Allah, can a human being think like that? Next one is Inna Allaha Yamuru Bil Adli Wal Isani Wa Yitai Zil Qurba Wa Yanha Anil Fashai Wal Munkare Wal Bagje Ya Izzakum La Allah Kum Tazakkaroon See how much, how much knowledge is there, how much information is there for us to establish the system of deen. The fundamental point about what we have stated in this book is that you administer justice to everyone, give full haq to everyone. If some deficiency remains in someone due to some reason, then compensate for this deficiency, even if something more has to be given above their haq, and in this way maintain the balance in the society. And implicit in this is to find it out as well. Don't wait that some poor fellow, some yatim and miskeen will come to your door, only then you will do it. You go out and find it out yourself. And that is the responsibility of Mu'mineen as well. Don't sit in idle and say that Allah will take care of everything. I'm fine. I'm a beneficiary of this system, so I don't have to go out and do anything. The beginning of this justice and ihsan is to be commenced from your own near ones, family members and people around you, then keep extending this process wider universally. Protect yourself from miserliness, i.e. do not do this, that you keep everything for your own self. This is in relation to fasha. The limits which Allah has established for you, never transgress from them, do not break the law under any circumstances. These are ethical values and are explained for this reason so that you keep the lofty aims of life before you and do not consider life as a mere physical animalistic existence. Again, we should look at this verse again and again and say, can human mind create this verse? Can a human mind write this? Allah summed up the guidance, can human intellect produce anything like this? لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ أَفَلَا تَعْكِلُونَ we have gone through this verse previously as well, but I thought it is good to reiterate it. Say to them that according to this program, now we have sent a code of laws towards you in which is hidden the secret of your own eminence and loftiness. If you try to understand with a bit of intellect or reasoning, then this reality will become unveiled before you that this code of laws is bestowed to furnish you with eminences and prosperities. Allah does not wish to achieve any aim of his own from this. So this is a book for us. It is not about praising Allah. It is not about uh, when the Quran says zikr Allah, it means following his laws, finding out what exactly he wants from his creation called Adam, called human beings. And we will understand that of Allah Taqilun if we use intellect to its extremities. And then is the verse which I have quoted before as well. I'll go through part of it. What will be achieved by obedience to these laws? According to this very law, we will bestow power as a consequence of their iman and solid deeds and will strengthen that system of life which we have approved for them. Its consequence will be this, that their fear will transform into peace. 
And remember, Quran says that if you're living under man-made system, you will always have fear because men like to enslave others. They don't respect humanity. People in power hate other human beings. And we should keep it in mind all the time. And Quran says that you have to have an affection for other human beings. You have to take care of the whole of mankind, irrespective of their beliefs, so that they can only follow our laws and do not commit shirk. So there is a formula given here. Can human being think of this formula? Bottom line is, there are only two categories of people in the world, according to the Quran, Hizbu Shaitan, and this is the verse, who think they do not need the guidance of the Quran and come up with excuses. For example, that they can produce what is given in the Quran and they follow everything in the world but the pure Quran. Hezbollah, and they are the party of Allah, Jamaat Mu'mineen, who seek guidance from the pure Quran. And after understanding it, come to this conclusion that it is from Allah. And it is very important that each one of us convinces himself that this book of Allah is from Allah, a human thought cannot produce anything like this. And once they confirm it, then see how their Iman grows, how it strengthens, how it multiplies, and how their self reaches that eminence, that khulq nazim for which the Quran has come to us, and we can then establish the system of deen. And they follow it and create a developed self with new life and get benefits of this life as well as of the hereafter. And it is that simple. And finally, a schematic to illustrate the issue at basic level. Allah with all of his attributes plus infinite and purest intellect with access to the human thought process sends down the Quran for guidance to fulfill the demand of human creation. What I've written over here, infinite and purest intellect is from our own perspective in order to understand it. Otherwise, Allah is beyond our imagination. The Quran arrives progressively from outside to meet the needs for the guidance of the human psyche because human psyche cannot create it themselves, which starts to expand to accommodate its finer details. Only that psyche which is looking for guidance and is willing to accept its teaching and then act on these laws, values, principles, and attributes. This needs time, effort, intense reflection, steadfastness, and patience. Patience is very important uh, on this path, because it is a very slow pedantic path in which signs do appear, but these appear slowly. As our self develops, we find the signs within us and also among us once we come together. This self does not find any resistance to its guidance and keeps growing willingly with no external or internal compulsion. And we should always test it. Am I following this path under any external compulsion or inner compulsion? Am I following it because of fear of the hereafter? Or am I following it to develop myself with the goal of establishing the system of deen? Am I with others, other mu'mineen, because of some my own benefits? Or I am on this for the sake of Allah, striving on this path to establish the system of deen? Those who find access to the Quran find it interesting and approach not to find guidance, but to read it with their own previous belief systems. They take part of it to justify their beliefs, which they are unwilling to question. Why should they? The beliefs which they hold provide them with worldly benefits. They do not wish to change these man device systems as they are the beneficiaries. Those who do not see a system of deen in the Quran literally do not get any benefit from the Quran. It is they who come with these kind of questions. For example, there is guidance within man. The Quran is merely an aid or through evolution, mankind will reach the truths of the book. So no need for it. Or it can be compiled by human intellect. That is through the books of Ahadith and all that is written outside the Quran to, to misguide people. And with that, I come to the end. Thanks for your time and for sharing this today. Please feel free to share it with your contacts. You may like to subscribe for future talks related to the Quranic system of Deen.